What is good, everybody, man? Let me know if y'all can hear me in the chat as people roll in here. Second live stream of the week, man. There's just been so much going on, and I wanted to make sure to get to some of the topics you guys submitted for for the off season. They're kind of mailbags. We're just gonna call them live shows this year, man. Um, I'm gonna try to do as I'm gonna try to pick dates, man. With my my schedule's a little bit hectic right now, but I'm gonna try to find two to three days a week to come on each week and do live streams, man. I want you guys to contribute to the topics. That way, you guys are invested in what we're talking about. So I know there's still a lot of people, man, who want to talk the Ed Reed Bethune Cookman situation, but um, again, there's a few there. There's a few things that I'm not going to address personally. I'll give my opinions on things that I feel comfortable giving it on, but there's a lot of things that are a lot of things in the situation that me as a non HBCU graduate, me having the background I do that I just don't feel comfortable speaking on because I don't feel like it's my place. So. That's where we're going to draw the line on this show. Listen, like I said last show, call lines are still open for you guys to give your opinion on on things that have happened. I know the Roland Martin interview ha- has really stirred up a few things. I'm going to address a few things that I, that people reached out to me and asked it just if I knew had any information or things like that about. Also, I did kind of reconvene with, with my Bethune-Cookman people, with my coaches that I talked to. There is two new potential candidates that have personally reached out to Bethune Cookman and expressed uh, expressed interest in the job. So Bethune Cookman is rolling on this coaching search. I know there was a lot of people wondering whether Bethune Cookman was going to give Ed Reed a chance after his interview last night, where he said that him and his team have reached back out to Bethune and, at least try to open back up talks, see if there's any reconciliation they could have. That's not happening. I think Bethune released a statement earlier today that said, this is over. Um, Ed Reed and them are going their separate ways. It'll be interesting to see if Miami welcomes Ed Reed back or if if, if he just takes a year off and kind of handles his business, which I think is probably what's best for everyone in the situation and um also going to look at some of the best fcs out of conference games i also added a a, a, la- a latter topic because someone messaged me on twitter i also picked out some i was i would say intriguing i'm not going to call them potential upsets yet but some very very intriguing fcs versus fps matchups in 2023 we're going to go through talk a little bit about some of the top fcs nfl draft prospects kind of give you guys what i'm thinking of guys who potentially could go where in the draft and what i'm hearing from some of the scouts i talked to and made connections with last year as i you know, went to the combines, went went to the different senior bowls and things like that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the HBCU coaching fellows for the East West Shrine Bowl, which came out earlier today. Two great HBCU coaches got picked to have, um, I, I think it's like an internship or they get to work with some of the NFL coaching staffs involved in that game. And make sure to hit the like button, subscribe. If you already have not, call the number 701-779-9585. That is already open. I'll be checking that periodically. But we'll start off with some positive news before we get into the crux of everything. Today, the East-West Shrine Bowl did announce the 2023 HBCU Coaching Fellows for the Shrine Bowl this year will be Jackson State Director of Player Personnel was his title under the previous coaching regime. It will be interesting when Jackson State releases the full list of their staff, whether he has an additional role or it's under a new moniker, but he was the Director of of Player Personnel at Jackson State. Otis Ridley, Coach O, everyone knows the moniker. Go ahead and text Coach O if you're looking to get a Jackson State offer. Also, new Grambling offensive coordinator slash running back coach slash QB coach apparently is what a Grambling alum told me is that he potentially could also be working with the quarterbacks, which is interesting. Tony Hall has not, from from his background, has not worked one-on-one with quarterbacks really. When he was a high school coach, his quarterback did win the, the Louisiana Gatorade State Player of the Year, but he was not the direct quarterback coach. So, It'll be really interesting to see how that works. But both of these guys headed out to the Shrine Bowl. I know uh, Tiger Talk, uh, Ken Clark, and all those guys will be out there for that game. So I'm sure both of these guys will get a little bit of shine as they deserve. But this is a huge opportunity. We've seen um, 
We've seen the NFL fellowships throughout this throughout like the fall camps with TC Taylor, also Vincent Dancy getting that opportunity last year. We've seen the senior bowl opportunity for TC Taylor. If I remember right, last year TC Taylor got to go coach at the senior bowl. So this is a huge opportunity for both Coach O and Tony Hall. If I, I've I talked to some coaches to kind of try to get some behind the scenes of what this could mean for a career to be able to work one-on-one with NFL teams even if it doesn't lead to a direct job this season those connections and the ability to get yourself in front of a, a room of people that if you weren't invited to this you otherwise wouldn't get in front of ability to connect to future NFL players get to coach one-on-one with them get to be very hands-on with their development as they work toward the draft is instrumental in advancing your coaching career. We saw uh, K.J. Black, FAMU offensive coordinator. He's now working with the Los Angeles Rams due to the NFL fellowship that he had. So a major, major opportunity for Otis Ridley from Jackson State and Tony Hall from Grambling State. I'm extremely excited. If you want to go back and get some more background on Hall, I believe it was two live streams ago um, in terms of the offseason mailbags. We really broke down who he is, what he's going to bring to Grambling State. And I really do think his his recruiting, his background in the state of Louisiana is really going to unlock a lot of things for Grambling on the offensive side of the ball. And him being of a, a very successful as a running back coach, I guess that's the best way to put it. It could unlock a lot of things for Grambling because we all know my biggest criticism, a lot of people in the chat, a lot of people who've called in were Grambling just didn't commit to running the football. They had all these great athletes at running back and they just – did, they didn't run the football. So Tony Hall, I think, coming in as the offensive coordinator does a lot of – I say corrects a lot of wrong for that. And for him to get this opportunity as he steps into that position only solidifies that they made a great hire for offensive coordinator as Hall is headed out to the East-West Shrine Bowl. Um, so <sighs> what's next for Bethune-Cookman? Let's just go ahead and get into it. If you tuned in last, what was it, Sunday night, had a live stream kind of previewing the initial shortlist. We talked about Kevin Sumlin being on that shortlist of people who has already interviewed that they're going to circle back to. So I still think he's very, very tied into he's the head coach and general manager of the Houston Gamblers over at the USFL. I would be very shocked if he gave up that opportunity to come back and coach at Bethune-Cookman. I think there was a chance to talk him into taking the position when the season still – it had a, it had a few months to kick off, but right here up at kickoff, I just don't see him being able to abandon that position right now. So I would say Kevin Sumlin, he's going to get a call, but I would be very, very surprised if he answered it and, and was receptive to that potential opportunity. Um, my odds-on favorite, Raymond Woody, a guy who has – massive, massive, I mean, Florida ties. He's coached at Florida Atlantic under Willie Taggart, whose coaching tree he comes from. Coached with him at Florida State as the linebackers coach from 18 to 19. Coached at South Florida. Was the head coach at both Bayshore High School and Palmetto High School. And was the defensive coordinator at Bayshore to kick off his career in 1996. This guy has never really had a chance to be a head coach at the collegiate level. I think he's kind of waited out earned his opportunity somewhere. And I think when you look at his experience, man, he would be a great hire for Bethune-Cookman. And I'm going to get into it. I got to slide with my final thoughts on the the last time, unless something crazy happens on my thoughts on the Bethune-Cookman Ed Reese situation. Raymond Woody, to me, Kevin Sumlin, some of these other camps we're about to talk about, those guys, resume-wise coaching, are a better coaching hire than Ed Reed was. So... I want to reiterate, there's this narrative going around that because of some of the problems Bethune-Cookman is facing in terms of infrastructure, board of directors, you know, all the storylines you guys are hearing, man, if we're talking just strictly football hire, all five of these guys on this slide are more qualified to be the head coach and have a better coaching pedigree than Ed Reed did coming in. When you look at a guy like Raymond Woody, whose experience goes back to 1996, has coached at the group of five level, has coached at Oregon, Florida State, has won conference championships as a recruiting coordinator, outside linebackers coach, associate head coach. This guy has prepared for this opportunity and has the recruiting ties in Florida already built into his background to get Bethune-Cookman into some doors into some crucial Florida high schools. 
that is going to pay off in his ability to dip back into his connection book and reach out to guys he coached with at Oregon, guys he coached with the WKU, guys he coached with the FAU. That that would be, I, I really do think that's more important than people are giving it credit for because I think people are really, really caught up in a big name, quote unquote, celebrity hire. A lot of these guys are great coaches and a lot of these guys got great connections. If I had to put money on it, I still think Raymond Woody is going to be the guy. The next one on the list, a guy who I don't see necessarily leaving his spot because of how well he has it set up, Chinnisberry. Coaches over at Benedict College and... I just, what I said last live stream is I don't see him leaving because of how strong things are at Benedict. Right now, outside of its D2, outside of its D2 to FC or, or D2 to Division One, I, I don't, can anyone say Bethune is a better job than what Benedict is right this second in terms of what he would have to deal with off the field? That That's a real debate. And so, Unless Chinnis Berry is just looking for a D one opportunity, I don't see, uh, I, I don't see why he would necessarily take this job. But at least if you're Bethune Cookman, at this point you got to turn over every rock to try to find the best candidate, um, the the best candidate to take over the spot. So you have to give Chinnis Berry a call. He's coached at Southern. He's he's coached in North Carolina A and T, Howard, Kentucky State, Fort Valley State. The, the, the list goes on and on in terms. I mean, nobody is more in, ingrained in HBCU coaching than Chinnis Berry. It's just he interviewed for the UAPB job, supposedly, didn't get it or turned it down. If, if it happened to be that he turned down the UAPB job, I don't see why in the world he's accepting this job. So I, 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 Chinnis Berry is a call they're going to make, but I would be very hard-pressed to see him necessarily accepting that job and with Raymond Woody going back to him right now he doesn't have a job after Willie Taggart is out at FAU so I, I really do think Raymond Woody could just be looking to jump back in but Nard Clark is a name I said last live stream has expressed some interest in coaching circles in this job is from Tampa Florida played for the Bengals and Seahawks played down at the U was a third round draft pick he got drafted out of Miami in the in the, in the 90s he's coached to James Madison Coached at FIU, coached at South Florida, coached at Hampton, co coached at Pittsburgh, went back to Hampton as the defensive coordinator, coached at UAlbany, and is currently the head coach at Robert Morris. He's probably going into a year where if he doesn't win this year, Robert Morris, he's probably out. And I really do think he's been, he's been craving an opportunity to get back into Florida. And so I just – the. Pr I said on the last, and I want to get y'all's opinion because we're going to keep it. We're, we're giving you guys just all the facts. Last season, Robert Morris did not win a football game. Robert Morris went 0-11 last year, finished last in the Big South. Things have really took a spiral for that program. If you're already facing all the off-the-field issues, if you're already facing all the question marks in terms of what BCU is going to be moving forward, what is the fan base's reaction going to be to a guy who just finished the last season 0 11? Now, this is a guy who has led them to the top of the NEC. They finished second their last year in the conference, seven and five, six and one in the NEC. But since that move to the Big South, things just things just haven't really worked out for him. But he's a guy who's shown he can succeed in Florida. Do you take a chance on a guy who's a home state guy and just say that Robert Morris, we've seen coaches bounce back. Listen, Connell Maynard did not do good at his stop right before he got to Alabama AM. and m Can you just say it was a learning experience and maybe he can be better here? And what is the fan base's reaction going to be to just his overall record? We know fans aren't going to look behind the scenes at injuries, matchups, scheduling. They're just going to see 0-11 last year. And I can only imagine what the media is going to say about that. And so that would be my one drawback on Clark, even though he does have a lot of connections it, in in the in the in the state of Florida, and he's a and he is a proven coach at the FCS level. Now the the new name I got I uh, got a phone call right after I went off live on Sunday night and said add this name to the list. The name is Altry Denson, 
If you're a diehard FCS fan and been watching the show, you know exactly who Autry Denson is. He was the former coach at Charleston Southern. He just stepped away this past season. Charleston Southern goes and hires, uh, I believe it's Gabe uh, Garanda and from, from Albany State. This is a coach that apparently has also expressed interest. As a player, played for the Buccaneers, Dolphins, Bears, Colts, Lions, played a little bit in the CFL. He was a running back out of Notre Dame, a seventh-round pick. Is out. It was born in Florida as well, has Florida connections. Coached at Pope John Paul High School down in Florida in 2010 and actually got one of his coaching starts at Bethune-Cookman. He was the running back coach for three seasons. Running back coach for three seasons at Bethune Cookman before moving on to Miami of Ohio. Coached at Notre Dame for four seasons, developed some really great running backs for the Fighting Irish. Would they be interested in bringing him back? That that's a major question. At, at Charleston Southern, he went fourteen and twenty-two overall record. But man, Charleston Southern never finished below third in conference. They only had they only had two years where they had a losing record in conference. His first year four and two in conference, and he competed really well with the North Carolina A and T's of the world, the Campbells of the world. What happened is Charleston Southern. I, was t- I went back and looked. Man, their scheduling was brutal. I don't under like I get it. They probably needed money games, but man, they scheduled some absolute killers year in and year out. And so you would just get beat up by these FBS teams. And your record will look atrocious, but you go, they went two and eight the, his last year, but they were two and three in conference. They competed in conference and finished third. So they just scheduled a death row out of conference schedule. And so I think Autry Denson is someone you guys should pay attention to. I got called from the guy Bethune Cookman and he said, listen, add him to the list because he's already reached out. And the final name, I didn't put a picture up there. What I was told is, and this is, This is something you get when people are trying to, you know, lead people in in a direction is they said there is an uh, they don't want to name him on be kind of progressing as well. And he don't want to be named because he has a job right now. And he said there's an unnamed recruiting coordinator at a power five program that has reached out. And just right now, they don't want it released to the public. They don't want it to leak. So I can't know the name, but they did say there's an unknown P5 recruiting coordinator that has expressed interest as well, but doesn't want to his name out there because he is, he's at a job. And if he doesn't take the job, he doesn't, he doesn't want his employer to know, which is fair enough. But there's, a, there's apparently interest from at least six, six people. And this Bethune Cookman job people are calling about. And I, I think there is a misconception too. And I, I, I want to say this from a, from a institutional aspect from an institutional aspect, yes, there's things there's things that have to be done. There's things that are going to be a challenge for any coach that takes this job. But I, I, I'm sure there's some FAMU fans that can call in. There's some people who have followed Bethune-Cookman for a long time. And I don't know if my Bethune-Cookman grad's in the chat or not. But Bethune-Cookman was absolutely – I mean, they, they, were, they were having success in the MEAC. Up until they moved to the SWAC, Bethune Cookman was was not just a bottom of the barrel program, and they were having a lot of these same issues at, at at that point. From what I was told, and so like this is a program that you can succeed at, that you can win at. I think there's a there's a big misconception on social media with some people who are just now tuning into the situation, just now kind of paying attention to the football aspect of HBCUs. Like Bethune Cookman was not just this dumpster fire of a program that wasn't ever winning that wasn't competing like they were apps that they were beating people like they were one of the top competitive programs like in hbcu football and it's not like they like all these problems just emerged and that's when the football that it coincided with when the football program did succeed in the swag this this is a program that has succeeded regardless of the hardships that have happened on the institutional level and i think there's so many people who I guess are not educating themselves on that. Uh, it's just this. This isn't a this isn't a dumpster program. Like I think that's the that's the perception a lot of people are having, and, and that's just not the case. And I, I think Bethune Cookman graduates, Bethune Cookman supporters, they they deserve a little bit better than what they're getting in terms of the social media slander 
that I mean, th- this program can be good with the right people in charge. And so I think that's that's why I said last live show there was two roads they can go down. They can rush this hire and hope to and hope to God they because it's Tuesday and hope to God they can try to figure something out by national signing day next week. Or they can take their time, chalk up their losses in national signing day, and and, and just hire the right guy. And I think that's what they got to do because you've hired the right guy, regardless of some of the other things that need to be fixed. And, and, and Brian, that's, that's what I'm saying. Listen, I'm not saying that there aren't things to fix behind the scenes and on campus. And, and I'm hoping they're listening to the students, but I really do think we need to separate the students need to be protesting for better standards, better practices and better living conditions, all that. I hope all the students needs are met. But we have to separate what the students are asking for. We have to separate that from Ed Reed. You can get everything. They need to get everything they're asking for. But that doesn't mean that Ed Reed needs to be hired. Like multiple things can be true. And I think people are losing any nuance in an argument. Like just because the students are right and what they're protesting for is right does not mean that Ed Reed has to be hired. Like those are two mutually exclusive things. Like the students can be right. And what they're protesting about is a serious issue, but that doesn't mean you need to go and hire Ed Reed. So that that's, that that's the main thing I wanted to get in. And yeah, BCU has five playoff appearances. I, I don't know about that. It that's, that's tough. I w I wouldn't necessarily say that. And so like, that's, that's where, I wanted to get my final thoughts in is that people just have to be more nuanced in their thing. This isn't a, this isn't one side saying that don't help the students and don't hire Ed Reed. And we just, we just say F it. Everyone, you know, everyone was wrong. And the other side is just like, have a little bit of nuance and a little bit of critical thinking. Like that's, that's the biggest thing with social media. When you got, when, when you try to, I'm trying to word this right, but when you try to have a real argument about real issues on social media, when you're limited to however many characters Twitter limits you to, so many things are lost in translation. So many things are being taken taken out of context. You're having to take crucial pieces of your argument out to fit that character limit. There is no reason you there's no reason that you should be having critical discussions about student needs and and what really needs to happen on, on Twitter? It's just it's never going to work, and nothing's ever going to get done, and no and no one's ever no one's ever going to get anything done like that. And so, you know, for me, I don't want to necessarily speak on the institutional stuff because that's not my place. Um, I'm not an HBCU grad. I'm still newer in the space. I mean, listen, I've been around just a little bit now, but I'm still newer to the space. And listen, people were sending me clips. Some, you know, some people are still taking shots at me for being in the space and covering HBC football. And that's all good. Like I, I figured that was coming. But at the end of the day, people have to understand that just the students need better. Ed Reed has conducted himself in a way that any head coach that wants a job can't act. And there's just too many people picking one side or the other and adopting issues that that just aren't right. Like have a little bit of a, like think for yourself here and understand that like multiple things can be true. And I'm really, really, uh, I'm really, really love seeing that the students are taking a stand on what they think is right and exercising their rights to speak up and and, and get things done. And I'm hoping things get done, but at the same time, man, like there's a way to approach things. There, there's a way to approach things. And Ed Reed did not approach the approach it correctly. And I think what's happening is you see a lot of people going with the crowd. It's really, really hard when listen, I mean, I, I, I feel it. It's really, really hard when you got a bunch of comments saying, Oh, you're you're saying you're you're doing this, you, you're just hating your and they want to support the celebrity. It's the popular thing to do, and I get it. But at the same time, when you look at coaching hires, let's just take a look at coaching hires across the FCS this year. Let's just take HBCU football. The two best coaching hires, in my opinion, were not celebrity hires. Even with the Ed Reed hire, even if Ed Reed stuck, let's just uh, throw him back in there. Vincent Brown to North Carolina A&T 
and T.C. Taylor to Jackson State were the two best coaching hires of the entire offseason at HBCU football and two of the best hires in the FCS regardless. As much as as much opportunity and and you can get resources and, and it would draw popularity and, and all this stuff, at the end of the day, you still have to have someone who coaches football. And I've said this repeatedly. What Jackson State did by hiring Dion was lightning in a bottle. And I, I really don't I I really don't think it's something that can be captured by just hiring any old NFL Hall of Famer or or quote unquote celebrity or anything like that. You you have to at the end of the day, things have to go right. They have to have the support. They have to have the coaching staff. They have to have an AD that is there. They have to have the fan base. They have like if we really sat down and went line by line and had a list of things that had to go right for Dion at Jackson state, man, Jesus Christ, that the list of things the, of lightning in a bottle that you would have to catch and Edry could have worked and that's fine. But I still don't think it would have been what 18 straight swag games won. And, and, and the domination we saw in the recruiting classes, like I, I still, I still think people are confusing that with, we could just go hire anybody at this point. And that's and and anyone can vouch for me in this chat. Me and Scotty got into it about it. I don't think Cam Newton can just jump in and be a and, and be a game changing coach. I don't think Ray Lewis can just jump in and change a program from the ground up in a year. I don't I don't think Warren Sapp can do it. I don't think Marshall Falk can do it. Like, look at how hard it is for Eddie George to and what he's doing at Tennessee State. Like there's there's potential that he could be fired this year. Eddie George could be fired this year and him and, and him and Dion were mentioned in the same breath when they were hired. He's potentially going to get fired this year if they if they don't win in the OVC. It is hard to do. Like this isn't just something that you can walk in with your name and, and whatever and just go and win get like no one's throwing games on the field. You still like in in, in Eddie George, I love him and I I interviewed him great guy but at the end of the day he's still recruiting at a high level and 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 on top of that and i've heard ken clark i've heard scotty i've heard a lot of people in this space talk about this is how many position coaches are being overlooked for some of these positions because they don't have the name like when when, when i when i did the show after a t fired Sam Washington, and I talked about Vincent Brown, I, I was messaged by a few people saying, how was this guy never a head coach? Like, if you took Vincent Brown's resume, took the name, took the picture off, and just had resume versus resume with some of the coaches that you've seen hired, is there any question who should have got some of these jobs? Yeah, a, a single question? If you take if you took a look at the um Jimmy Rogers who just got promoted at South Dakota State, look at that resume and how has he never been a head coach anywhere before? Like there are so many great positional coaches working their way up through the ranks that are getting overlooked right now. And if you haven't seen it, um Jason Brown from Last Chance you talked about on the interview with him is that there's so many guys or positional coaches who are in little nooks and crevices that you've never heard of that should be head coaches over some of the guys that got head coaching jobs right now. So listen, I, my, my final thoughts, I don't, you know, you can call in too. Um, I think I got the call the number pinned in the chat somewhere. Um, the, the thing is, is like, man, we can't get enamored with names. You got to get enamored with results on the field, success, recruit, like actually judge these guys by what they've accomplished in their career, man. And also, if you're somebody who, if you see something on social media, if you see something on, you know, wherever, if you don't know if it's not, if it's, if it's a false narrative, if it's clickbait, if it's anything, stop sharing it. The issue that everything is having is that when things get out there that are false, that are, that are, that are, that are untrue, that, that look down upon a certain school person, individual, it's like, man, it gets shared like wildfire. 
if you, if you don't know if that is true, stop sharing it. Stop spreading false information and just outrageous takes across social media because all it does is help it spread like wildfire. And then people who don't do their research are going to take it as fact. It, it, it has been outrageous. Some of the stuff that I've seen on social media from comparing every Durant to uh, Kirby Smart's uh, pre, <laughs> pre-game speech to the false information about Jackson, for the, the false information about Bethune Cookman, man, like it's just it's gotten out of hand at this point. It, it really it, it it's gotten out of hand. And like I said on Doc Holiday show, man, it's, it's really been exhausting because for me, the fact that National Signing Day is next week. If I pull the chat, there's people in this chat. Well, maybe not my chat and some other channels chats and some other sites because you guys are all pretty big football fans. There's people that don't even know National Signing Day is coming up that are caught up in the Ed Reed drama on January 24th. when we got National Signing Day coming up next week, man. That's what I'm excited about. People should be talking about recruiting football grading classes which you no know, who's got the who's got the best class and, and man there's been some great players to commit in the in the past few days that is that's crazy and I do want to say Edry was never offered the Jackson State job I don't it almost looked like watching the video that he just yelled that to yell that and he was not offered the Jackson State job at all it it, it didn't happen and i know for a fact because i've heard from people inside the program that he wasn't even top three he was not even top three in the coaching search and zoe and ken and everyone know exactly what i'm talking about how does a coach offer his own position that'd be like nick saban saying he was going to retire tomorrow calling Kirby Smart and said, hey, bro, you want to pack up your stuff and come to Alabama? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and offer the, you this job so my AD doesn't have to. That never happens. That, that, that's, not how, that's not how this works. Like, if, I, if any of you quit your job today, could you call your friend and just give them the position? No interview, nothing. Like, you, <laughs> you can't just get a job offer because you're friends. There was no, there was no offer at all between every to Jackson state. And it's just, I don't know about the Grambling. I've reached out to, I've reached out to some Grambling people and I was told he wasn't offered it, but you know, with Grambling, I'm, I'm not as well connected at Grambling as I am some other places, but I don't know. And, and even if he was, it looks like they dodged a bullet. I, I don't know. Hugh has he hasn't proven himself yet, but at least he's not out here doing this. And Hugh's recruiting pretty well right now. I would say at a B plus level, at least. So uh, it's just uh, last night's interview. If you needed any more proof why Ed Reed is not going to be the head coach at Bethune Cookman, look no further than the interview last night. Because I'm telling you guys, that was not passion. That was not just passion. And I do believe he cares about the kids. Like I said, multiple things can be true at once. But that wasn't all passion. And you can't, you, you can't there's a way you got to conduct yourself as a head coach when you're in front of the public, when you're representing the university. And that's definitely not it. Definitely not it, man. So listen, that's my final thoughts on Bethune Cookman, Ed Reed. If you want to call in and talk about something else, I'm cool with it. But like I said, there's some things in this debate as a non-HBCU person with my background that I'm not going to address. But those are just my thoughts on things that I thought I did have the right to kind of address and things I did have opinion on. But man, I appreciate you guys. Again, man, hit the like button, subscribe. But let's get into some football. There, there's, I don't know how many of you in the in, in, in here, all you guys are football fans, man. Let's talk, let's talk some football because I know if you're like me, I am so tired of every other stream being about every and Bethune-Cookman. But, man, top FCS out-of-conference matchups for 2023. There are still some schools who have not finalized their schedules for next season. But <clears throat> Tuesday, January 24th, going through, I picked some of my favorite. Listen, if you're a fan and you don't see your favorite team on here, your favorite matchup, comment it, call in, and let me know why. These are the ones I pick. This is my list. So if you, if you see one that I potentially overlooked, anything like that, let me know. But we're kicking it off. Week zero, South Carolina State, Jackson State, Swag Miak Challenge. I, I cannot wait for this matchup. 
This is a Celebration Bowl rematch from two seasons ago. You have it's T.C. Taylor's debut. It's the first debut of whoever wins the quarterback battle for Jackson State. And then for South Carolina State, it's the first look at did they – did they address any quarterback needs? Did they did they address the loss of Shaq Davis? Did um, DW? This is out of out of conference matchups, out of conference. So they they can't be the the teams can't be in the same conference. FAMU JSU is a, a divisional matchup. Um, but man, I'm I'm really really excited for South Carolina State Jackson neutral site game. I am absolutely hype for this game this this would be a statement game for either team whoever wins this game is that's a statement win and that's a major major step forward in uh, achieving their goals for that season also we um a big out of conference matchup austin p southern illinois this is a big one for austin p they were left out of the playoffs this is a game against an mvfc team who's probably going to finish anywhere probably top five top six in that conference Austin P needs to make a statement here. This would be a huge out of conference win to put a feather in their cap for if they do not win their conference, they can have this game if they're on the bubble and see if they can get into the playoffs this next season. A one that a lot of people probably aren't going to have on here. Holy cross Mary Mac. I get it. Not very popular teams. There's probably some people in the chat. who probably don't even know where either of these schools are. Holy cross won the Patriot League champions four straight years, going for five in a row next season. Mary Mack just won the NEC last year. Um, This is going to be a very interesting matchup to see where Mary Mack is as a program. They weren't able to make the playoffs last year due to the transitional rules. This will be a huge out-of-conference matchup to test where they are, and Holy Cross can just keep uh, making a statement, as they always do. The probably the game if I had to rank these number one easily, South Dakota State, Montana State over in Brookings. I believe it's week two. That's where I'm going to be week two. There's no debate. I've, I haven't released my FCS game day schedule. I'm going to be at South Dakota State, Montana State. It's a semifinal rematch for the past two seasons. The defending national champions versus arguably another top five squad that Montana State's putting together. I don't need to say any more on that one. North Dakota State Eastern Washington is also a big one, a national championship rematch from a few seasons ago. And this game is also, if I'm not mistaken, in the Viking Stadium as well. This is a huge, huge game in Minneapolis early in the season. We're going to see what North Dakota State looks like. Um, after losing a lot of their roster, Eastern Washington trying to bounce back from a from a not I would say a less than stellar year for them historically is still a major major out of conference matchup northern Iowa Weber State part of the MVFC Big Scott challenge every year this will be a very interesting matchup to see where Weber State stands after they get a new head coach uh Mickey stepping in this year after they they lose their head coach this all season UNI is always a tough out of conference opponent this will be an interesting game Alcorn State Stephen F Austin do I say anything else Last year, Alcorn in Lorman, four-hour rain delay, it felt like. They lost because of punts. They lost because of special teams, man. They really lost because of special teams. They got to travel to Stephen F. Austin this year. They're facing the defending WAC champs. It'll be interesting to see if Alcorn can pull off the upset. This would be a huge out-of-conference win for the SWAC. Probably one of the biggest of the year, Alcorn State going to Stephen F. Austin. Stephen F. Austin is replacing a lot of talent. B.J. Thompson, Xavier Gibson, Alcorn State's returning a lot of talent. Can Alcorn get it done on the road against Stephen F. Austin? Western Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, a major – I'll just pick this one because West Western Carolina is my sleeper team next year. Absolutely love this team. I think offense is going to be crazy. EKU is going to have one of the better secondaries in the country. Love that stylistic matchup. That's why I had to throw it up here. And then finally, the rematch everybody wants to see. First, I can't wait for this matchup. And we'll have to win matchup. And they don't, I, I don't know what to say. Like, you get at home.
All right. Let me know if y'all can hear me. Let me know if y'all can hear me, man. Sorry. Power flickered, as y'all know, man. We're having bad storms across the south. Um, so, yeah, uh, we, we are back, though. <laughs> we are back. Let me know if y'all can hear me in the chat before I get started again. Let me uh, get back over here. Cool. Appreciate y'all sticking around, man. We didn't even lose that many viewers. Appreciate y'all for that. Um, but, yeah, Campbell Central. I don't know how much of y'all y'all heard um, of that, but that's a must win for Central. You just win the Celebration Bowl. You get Campbell coming to 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 your house this time. You don't have to travel down to Campbell. This is a big this is a big game and also a huge game for Davius Richard as well. He has to have it. It, it really does have to have a big. He has to have a big game. He played that was probably his worst game of the year. It, it it really was. I mean, he, he threw, if I'm not mistaken, two big interceptions. The offense sputtered all game. He has to – this is his rebound game, especially with everything that Campbell's losing in the front, in the front seven. This this is a – this is a big – this is a big game for Central, and I'm just going to leave it at that. But those are my – those are my out-of-conference matchups. Now, I did add another topic. Someone messaged me about – doing you know potential FCS FBS upsets. Now I don't want to I don't want to lock myself into anything. So I'm not going to call them potential upsets. I'm just going to say they are intriguing right now. I want to see what everyone does in the signing day, the next transfer portal cycle before I start picking upsets because a lot of these group of five power five teams also I, I want to see what they what they look like as well. But some very, very interesting one, Idaho, Nevada. Nevada got absolutely demolished last season by Incarnate Word. And I really do think this is going to sound, this sounds weird coming out of my mouth. Idaho is a national championship contender next year. Like they are a legit problem to make a run to the quarterfinals, potentially semifinals. If everything works out, they've returned, all their impact players, Hayden Hatton, FCS All-American, they returned the Jerry Rice Award winner and Giovanni McCoy, going to be a massive, massive uh, piece to that offense. They return most of their defense next year. Idaho is going to be an issue. Nevada is not a great FBS program. This is absolutely a winnable game early. And Rhode Island, Georgia State, Georgia State has been an average group of five program at best. Rhode Island last year competed for the playoffs, competed in the CAA. We know uh, what I call the CAA is the FBS killers. I mean, they had the most FBS wins last year. They consistently put out teams that can compete against the FBS group of five. Rhode Island over Georgia State is a game that I am extremely interested to see. Now, it's very uncommon for me to put SEC teams on here. There's two this time, but Missouri was a garbage SEC team last year and they have not really upgraded much and South Dakota is a team that consistently gives power five programs issues consistently give I mean they gave K-State issues they've given a lot of those big 12 programs issues and with Missouri being extremely inconsistent in some key positions I would not be surprised if South Dakota gave Missouri all the business next year and I'm really really hoping to see more FCS upsets next year also I put this one here because not necessarily because I think it's an upset, but intriguing matches this game. Sac State traveling to Stanford. Troy Taylor leaving Sacramento State to take the Stanford head coaching job. He gets to play his former team year one. That is just an intriguing storyline in general. It would be amazing to see Sac State pull off that upset over Stanford over their old coach, Troy Taylor. I don't know if that'll necessarily happen. I've got to see what Sac State's kind of built like next year and see what Stanford does in the transfer portal and recruiting trail. But that is a game that is going to be interesting nonetheless. Now, Southern Illinois got an FBS win last year over Northwestern. They faced their in-state rival, Northern Illinois. Do not be surprised if Southern Illinois comes away with the win in that one. Also, ETSU, Jacksonville State. I felt like I was cheating with this one, but... Jacksonville State will be FBS next year. Do not be surprised if ETSU gives them problems just because the, the, the Gamecocks will be going through some growing pains moving to the next level. Jackson State, Texas State, not necessarily a game that I see being an upset, but a game that's going to be filled with storylines. There's a lot of people excited to see what Jackson can bring to this game. It'll be a huge test 
just after that FAMU and South Carolina State matchups to open up the season. And also Texas State, new head coach, G.J. Kinney, former Incarnate Word head coach, and he's building Incarnate Word 2.0 over, over at Texas State. A, a lot of the transfers that Texas State got were straight from Incarnate Word. They got a solid quarterback in Malik Hornsby from Arkansas, who was a four-star prospect who – do not be surprised if he looks like the next Lindsey Scott in that offense. It's going to be a great stylistic matchup, and I'm very, very excited just to see the storylines and and the hype going around that game. And, TJ, I don't know how big Texas State Stadium is, but I'll say this. Based on what I'm hearing, I would not be surprised if that game was a sellout or close to it. Is this, I don't I like yeah like Imperial. I don't think it's very big, but I would not be surprised if if Jackson State fans came in there and sold that game out. Um, I would be, uh, we'll see. But yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Also, Arkansas struggled with Missouri State last year. Western Carolina has a very very similar team. They built their team very similar to what Missouri State did. I wouldn't be surprised if if. The Catamounts gave Arkansas some issues if Arkansas did not revamp that defense. They're losing a lot of players on that defensive side of the football. The Razorbacks are. Look for WCU to potentially make things interesting in that one. Then finally, Bryant versus UNLV. UNLV, garbage. They've been beat by FCS schools, I think, the last few times they played them. Bryant probably wins this game. They were one point away from beating FIU last year. I would expect Bryant to beat UNLV. I don't have a lot of faith in UNLV just in general. They could play um, whatever, but yeah, I, I I just I don't see UNLV being super competitive. I'll be completely honest with you. That might be one that listen mark down Bryant over UNLV if you're a bet man because I just I don't see it. Oh, uh, let's see. No Graham versus L no Graham versus LSU. <laughs> no Graham versus LSU. TJ, I'm sorry. I don't see Gramlin beating L like. It's not that I don't know if Grambling will be any more improved. Next year, LSU is probably a legit championship contender, TJ. I mean, it is uh, – LSU is going to – in my opinion, it, it's going to be Bama or LSU for the West next year in the SEC. LSU is absolutely loaded next year. They're going to be a huge, huge problem. And then the final topic, man – um, oh, let me open back up the call lines in case you guys also want to call in. I forgot that shut down when the power went out. You are the only participant in the conference. All right. Uh, call the numbers pinned at the top of the chat and also scrolling across the bottom. But NFL draft prospects, I'll be releasing probably next week. I'm, I'm finishing up some film studies, some, some pros and cons. I'm going to start releasing some videos, highlighting, um, doing some film breakdowns on some of the top FCS prospects. Man, I really want to get some of these guys out here. And just in terms of media um, exposure, and also I'm reaching out to some guys to get some interviews set up. I'm going to try to pick a athlete per week and really spotlight him and, and make him like the FCS NFL draft prospect of the week on this show. Um, and so that's, that's my plan. And so I'm really not going to go super, super in depth. I'm not going to give like the full breakdown on each of these prospects. I'm going to do that on those, but just to kind of give you guys an idea of some of the dra top draft prospects based on what scouts are saying, what some of the NFL rating sites are saying, and, and just some ideas about where some of these guys could go. you got Cody Mock. He's probably the consensus number one FCS draft prospect for the most part. North Dakota State offensive lineman. This kid is 6'6", 303, straight out of North Dakota, and he is just a mauler. As a, as a guy who loves offensive line play, me and Coach Fred are breaking down the film for the national championship tomorrow. The kid is an absolute problem. He can play tackle. He played tackle most of his career. He can also probably move down to guard. There's a lot of scouts who are thinking – that he's going to move to guard due to his arm length. He has the height of 6'6", 300 pounds. That's perfect for a tackle, but his arms are not necessarily the length you would like an NFL tackle to be. So they're thinking due to his, his flexibility, moving him to guard at the next level. You And I've even heard him as high as late first round, but probably going to be a second, third round pick, early day two pick for Cody Mock out of North Dakota State three-time All-American, three-time MVFC All-Conference selection. This is a guy that's only allowed two career sacks um, in his entire career. And he's a guy who I think is 
could come in and probably find some sort of starting opportunity on an NFL roster next season or be in some rotational um be in some sort of rotational piece for whatever team ends up with them. But I would I would say probably second round would be my guess for Cody Mock. Also, Tucker Craft, South Dakota State, South Dakota State tight end. I would not be surprised if he's also a day two pick. Apparently, the scouts are loving him as 6'5, 255. There's a lot of people who are com- kind of comparing him to like a George Kittle type of tight end where he can block. He blocked a lot at South Dakota State, but he also has the athletic ability to be a true receiving threat for an NFL team. He can line up outside. He runs great routes. He has great hands and has the ability to be an explosive option at the tight end spot as a multi-time FCS All-American. And over his career has almost 100 catches for 1,200 yards, nine touchdowns. He, he's a big play threat, man. That that play against Montana State where he released up the field and burnt the safety one-on-one, got over the top of Montana State and made a huge, huge play to open up that game, man. It's just, it's just an example of what he could be. In 2021, played 15 games, had near 800 yards and six touchdowns that year for the Jacks. I would imagine Tucker Craft's probably going to be a second, third-round pick, and a lot of people are excited to see what his combine looks like and see what some of his – overall athletic scores are and things like that. But a lot of people are saying he potentially could be a very similar tight end to what a George Kittle looks like and and scheme wise fits in like at the 49ers. Also McClendon Curtis, man, I got to see him up close and personal at the Mercer game. Six, six, three thirty senior out of Chattanooga. This kid's a monster. He going to the senior bowl Anybody going to the Senior Bowl has a very good chance of getting drafted. I would imagine potentially late day two pick for him. He's a guy who over 50 career games, over 40 career starts. He started at tackle. He started at guard. He fit multiple different roles. I would, for me, I want to see what his arm measurement is going to be at the Senior Bowl. If his arms are long enough, I would imagine they keep him outside at offensive tackle. But you. At this point, man, it really just depends on, on on what they need. He played guard for the most part. This year they had some injuries and they moved him to left tackle, and he was just as good, one of the highest-graded offensive linemen, according to Pro Football Focus. So just the ability and the fact that Cole Strange was able to step right in for the Patriots also helps Curtis because there was a lot of people saying Curtis was just as good as Cole Strange, who's already made it to the league. So look for McClendon Curtis to be probably a day-two pick as well out of Chattanooga. Now, Andre Isovas, Princeton wide receiver, a lot of people are sleeping on him. And it's because he he played at Princeton where they don't really they're not really a an air raid attack conference and they play a little bit less games than everyone um, does each year. But his measurables, he's looking, you know, he has a different skill set, but he's almost like the Christian Watson prospect of the year for the FCS, where yes, the overall stats may not be gaudy in terms of him having like 1500 yards receiving or whatever but his measurables and his athletic ability are just off the chart 6'3 200 pounds long arms can get up there high point of football an excellent route runner he's been a multi-time fcs all-american has been all ivy league every year he started for princeton and he's also Going to the Senior Bowl. That's the key for a lot of these guys is going to the Senior Bowl. Over his career, 125 catches, almost 2,000 yards receiving, 16 touchdowns, averages about 15 yards per catch. He's a guy that I've, I think could could is probably a day three pick, I would imagine. Could slide into late day two, depending on what his combine. He is going to the combine and what his Senior Bowl looks like. That's where Christian Watson made his money. Christian Watson entered the draft process as probably a day three late day two pick due to his combine performance and his performance at the senior bowl. He shot up to potential first round and was drafted early second round. That's where his of us could, could potentially land, depending on what his pre-draft process looks like a swat guy here, a personal favorite, just because I know him, man, Mark Evans, a second, I would absolutely love to see him go day two. Yeah, he deserves it, man. He's what four time all swag now. At first, a consensus first-team All-American this past season for UAPB, one of the highest-graded offensive linemen in terms of one-on-ones, at, can can run block, can pass block, has the athleticism to really hang with, with a lot of different people. He's 6'4", probably about 300 pounds. His weight is going to 
his weight is going to determine a lot. If he can weigh in at, at a roughly around 300 to like 305, man, his stock goes through the roof on top of his athleticism. Because I do think he's going to test really, really well in the athletic portion in terms of agility, maybe not top end speed, but in terms of agility, hip bend, his, his footwork. His technique is what's going to put him up in the draft process, man. Mark Evans, a second offensive lineman from UAPB, is a name I am so excited to see at the next level. Also, Justin Ford, Montana quarterback, cornerback. This kid, from measurables to performance to mindset, is exactly what you're looking for in an NFL corner. 6'2", 200 pounds, long arms, rangy, and a ball hawk. I don't know, I don't know what else you need. From him, a day three pick just because, of course, he played at the FCS level. But this is a guy in just, I mean, he played two games in the COVID season. So let's say two years. In two years, had 11 interceptions and 28 pass breakups for Montana. And they had him in the wrong scheme. Like, this is a guy who, if you get him in a scheme where he can play man-on-man, one-on-one, he can shut down the side of the field at his highest potential. I think Justin Ford is... His draft stock is not as high as it should be because Montana used them in the completely wrong way. I, I talked to some coaches in Montana State when I went up there, and they were so frustrated with how they were using him in their scheme. Justin Ford, in my opinion, is someone you could see go to the next level and be better than he was at college because he goes to a team that uses him in the correct way. I think they used him a little bit better last season, but Montana this year tried to fit him into some a scheme that I don't think fit his skill set the best because I think they were trying to make up other players lack of skill sets with the scheme and it hurt him in terms of overall production. Look for Justin Ford to test out the roof this year, man. I'm really excited to see what he brings to the next level. I've had him on the show. The kid is amazing. Shaq Davis, South Carolina state wide receiver. Let's just be honest. Everyone knew he was here. A big time, deep play threat, a guy who could, I mean, he can go up and get it. And this is a guy who, put up 900 yards, 11 touchdowns, and averaged 20 yards per catch this season with a quarterback that could not throw a football from my desk to the window sitting about a few feet away from me. He did all that with zero quarterback last year. Eight touchdowns, averaged almost 20 yards per catch again. The two years prior, he averaged over 20 yards per catch and had 10 touchdowns. He's a guy who can stretch the field. He has the size to be to be a starting wide receiver at the next level, 6'5", 180, with the speed, with the production, I don't see any way Shaq Davis should fall out of this draft. I he he is going he is he should be drafted, and I would be shocked if he isn't. He's in the same boat as like a a James Houston, Jatari uh, Jatari Carter was last year for me. Is where if he don't get drafted, I need to hear from the scouts why. He should be drafted sometime in the day three round, if not a little bit higher, depending on what his testing looks like. Now Hunter Lipke. I'll keep it short on him. He's a fullback slash potentially tight end at the next level. 6'1", 2, 236, probably 240, was the MVP of the championship game, a two, three-time All-American. Coming off a shoulder injury, though, which is what I'm worried about his draft stock, is the fact that he's coming off a fresh injury. But Hunter Lipke probably going to be drafted later in the draft, probably day three pick. He's probably going to be used as a utility guy, similar to um, I can't remember his name, the fullback for the uh, mm, the full the fullback on the uh, 49ers. I, I want to say it starts with the J. I can see him being used like that at the at the um, at at the next level, and that's probably where he's going to fit. He'll probably be a day three guy because of trying to figure out where he fits into an offense. Now, Keenan Isaac. Another cornerback who I could see getting drafted. 6'3", 190 out of Alabama State was was an all-swag selection. It, it was even considered, from what I was told, for a few FCS All-American lists. 99 tackles over his four years. Nine tackles for loss. Two picks. 22 pass breakups over his career. And he only played one game in 2020. So, I mean, that's really just in three seasons. Keenan Isaac has the length. He has the versatility to play multiple different schemes and positions in the back in the defensive backfield. Apparently from Sam Herter reporting on it today, scouts are drooling over Keenan Isaac's potential. And I know there's listen, I still got a few more slides. So if you haven't seen your favorite player, hang tight. 
there's a lot of smoke surrounded that Keenan Isaac and Mark Evans, Mark Evans the second could be the first two HBCU players drafted this year. Scouts are loving what Isaac's ability, uh, Isaac's measurables and what he can bring to the next level. So do not be shocked if Keenan Isaac is the first or second guy off the board um, in the NFL draft this coming year. I know a lot of people are kind of sleeping on him, but just watch out, man. I, there's always those potential players that scouts fall in love with. And then Aubrey Miller, I, I've heard day three pick on him, but it will really depend on his senior bowl. I would imagine because they're going to put him in a lot of one-on-one situations with running backs and slot receivers in the open field. And that's a, that's a place where a lot of people have questions, but there's no doubt he's one of the best run defenders in the country in two seasons. This is in 26 games, games, guys. This is an insane stat. In 26 games, he had 226 total tackles, 23 and a half for loss, and eight and a half sacks. I just, 26 games, had 226 tackles, six forced fumbles, and nine pass breakups. He did a lot better in coverage this year, had six pass breakups when he was in that one-on-one coverage. And so, Aubrey Miller, to me, is a guy who is easily a day three pick and is a guy who, by the end of next year, depending on where he gets drafted, could be a significant contributor somewhere. And also on top of that, man, I got to love his leadership. To me, off the field things are, are stuff that's hard to measure for certain NFL teams because each NFL exec team is looking for something different. But you can't tell me off the field that there's any negatives to Aubrey Miller, man. He looks like just an absolute leader, a guy that you would want to trust in your program, a guy that you would want to have in the locker room. So I think Aubrey Miller day three pick for me and a guy who has a lot to prove at the senior bowl and could be one of the breakout stars across the FCS at the senior bowl, especially with his interview process, man. I think he's going to kill it. Montre Braswell out of Missouri state kick returner cornerback. Sorry. I I don't know why it says wide receiver there. I must've forgot to change it, but this is a guy who I put kick returner for a reason. He is going to be a guy who similar to, Montreal Washington out of Sanford is drafted probably because of his special teams. And this is and, and this is no shot to um to Zay. He's on he's on the list later, but this is a guy for his career. Montre Braswell averaged 30 yards per return in college. Over 1100 yards returned to kick every single year of his college career. And on top of that, had six interceptions and two returns off of interceptions as well. He can play corner. was a first-team all-MVFC selection at the corner spot, over 125 tackles as well, and 25 pass breakups. He's a guy who you can trust in the secondary and is a game-changer in key moments. He always seemed to have the big play on special teams. Look for Braswell to be that guy that gets drafted strictly off I mean, really and truly his potential in, in terms of special teams. That's a guy you're going to have to watch similar similar to Montreal Washington from Sanford last year. That surprised a lot of people. Isaiah Land as well. Going, you know, going to these all-star games, it's going to be a huge for him to see where he fits in schematically. Is he going to play more linebacker? Is he going to step down into a defensive end edge role? It'll be extremely interesting to see how they use him at you know at the senior bowl and how he fits into what that what the defenses want to do they're very limited they can't blitz things like that but i would imagine they're going to try to see his his size is so important listen I, that's the first tweet i'm sending out for mobile i am going to be at the weigh ins and all the measurables they got them listed on famu's website 64225 there is no chance no chance he 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 cannot weigh in under 240 245 at the Senior Bowl. He's got to have some weight on him when he weighs in in Mobile in the coming weeks. But in his career, man, production cannot be denied. 42 and a half tackles for loss, 29 sacks, most of those coming in the past two seasons. Can get to the quarterback, has a motor. I know Scotty was critical of it, but, man, a lot of those sacks came from him not giving up on the play. His reach, his retraceability and his ability to get to the quarterback and ha- use that top line speed and athleticism is important. And there's a lot of edge rushers, including the James Houston's of the world, that a lot of people doubted because of their size that have made huge impacts. Do not sleep on Isaiah Land. I still think he's a day three draft pick. 
And if he can weigh in about 240, 245 at the Senior Bowl and have a good week, do not be surprised if he can work himself into day two conversations. There's, there's a reason this guy had FBS P5 offers when he entered the transfer portal this offseason. Isaiah Land is someone that has a lot of potential, but there is a lot of question about his overall size and, and how he's going to fit into a defense. Now, this show could have lasted 15 hours, man. There were so many prospects I wanted to cover. But Jaleel McLaughlin is a running back who I think could – receive some late round consideration kind of like a Pierre Strong type where he's been so productive man 3,400 rushing yards in three seasons 30 rushing touchdowns in his career and for his career every six yards per carry was an FCS All-American all MVFC selection multiple times it, 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 there was times where he was the sole the sole offense for Youngstown State and there's some people in the MVFC in the chat that can tell you he is by far the most explosive option on that offense at, at times. He played at Notre Dame College as well. And if I'm not mistaken, man, he is one of the top rushers all time in NCAA history. He's 5'9", 183, a bit on the smaller side, but his his explosiveness and production can't be denied. Someone will probably take a waiver on him late in the draft. Also, Ryan Miller, a guy who I think could be a late day three, potentially undrafted free agent. I don't know how he's going to fit in. He played tight end at Furman. 6'2-210 is too small, in my opinion, to probably play tight end at the next level. But this is a guy who's also an FCS All-American, was probably the best tight end in FCS this year. And we talked about Jacoby Durant's performance against Clemson as a major reason why he got drafted. Ryan Miller this year against Clemson, that same big old bad Clemson defense that, that went out there and won the ACC, he had 13 catches for 95 yards and a touchdown against Clemson. And then in another biggest game of the year against Sanford, 10 catches, 87, a touchdown. And then in the first round playoff game that Furman won over Elon, nine catches for 70 yards and a touchdown. In every big moment that scouts are going to look at, especially that Clemson game, he played big. So look for Ryan Miller to get a look at least at the next level out of Furman. And then finally, one of my favorite guys to talk about, man, Xavier Gibson, is just that guy. Back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. Last year, 74 catches, 1,300 yards, 14 touchdowns, averages over 100 yards per game for a career, and on top of that is an FCS All-American special teams guy. Xavier Gibson, a bit undersized, but you've seen a lot of undersized wide receivers finding roles in the NFL. Xavier Gibson is a guy of high production that even if he doesn't get drafted, Probably has a skill set to get on an NFL roster somewhere. There's some honorable mentions. Isaiah Bolden, Jackson State. Again, special teams is extremely valuable in the NFL draft process. And there are scouts that will tell you if you don't play special teams, your chances of getting drafted drop dramatically if you're not a first or second round pick. Isaiah Bolden's ability to be explosive in the return game and on top of that can offer some depth at corner, gives him a chance to be drafted as well and makes him a top FCS prospect. B.J. Thompson out of Stephen F. Austin, his measurables put him right in the conversation. We know about Kamari Everett out of Bethune-Cookman. He would have been on the list, but after a, a tough season this past year, I'm really curious to see what his overall projections are. I want to see what his pre-draft process looks like moving forward. Nash Jensen out of North Dakota State, another offensive lineman. And then Darian Chafin out of UIW, who is going through. He had to have um, he had to have surgery after the playoff run for Incarnate Word, but he has one of the best measurables out of any of the wide receivers coming out of FCS. Has the production was a first team FCS All American for Incarnate Word. Look for Darian Chafin to get some looks, depending on what his injury status um, could be. But guys, call in uh, probably. Keep the screen going for about 10 more minutes. 701-779-9585 is the call-in number. I would say Zay has a pretty good shot too. Um, like I said, I just I couldn't make it endless. Um, I couldn't make endless slides, but Zay has a chance to one question about Zay again, kind of like Xavier, is that is his size going to be a detriment? Now, what Zay and Xavier and these undersized wide receivers have to do is light up the 40. I'm talking about they have to blaze it up, and they also have to show their value in other ways outside of just being a, a quote-unquote wide receiver, and they just have to find the right team. Um, and shout-out to you, Bishop, man. I appreciate you tuning in. What I was told by scouts is that 
once you get past about the fourth round, and this is why mock drafts are so bad, mock drafts are terrible because after about the fourth round, teams just start drafting based on things that we that the media and people don't see. They draft based on specific questions and interview processes. Um, in this package, we need a guy who can do this. So we're going to go draft this guy. And once about the fourth round, that's why you see people just get drafted almost randomly after about the fourth round is because teams change up their – it's not just by like Mel Kuyper's needs. Like they have other things that they're not telling people – that they need and they have certain things that they're looking for certain qualities in terms of all these personality tests and things like that, that they're mainly drafting for after about the fourth round. So Zay Xavier, even like Jaleel as an undersized running back, they just need a team who is looking for a, I would say like a, like a specialized weapon for a certain scheme or, or a certain thing they want to do. And that's how those guys get drafted. But I definitely could see Zay, if he doesn't get drafted, getting a, getting a contract somewhere. Cause I do think, and there's a reason I had him as an FCS, all American. I think two other publications did as well. The talent can't be denied. And I also think not just Zay out of the swag. I also do think Dallas Daniels too, has a great shot at potentially getting an opportunity route running next level, his ability to be an intermediate weapon cannot be undersold. So I think Zay and Dallas Daniels are two names from the swag at wide receiver that you can also probably throw in there. And Douglas, I, I saw your question earlier and I, I started, I'm, I'm personally really high on all corn this year. Um, I think all corn is going to be better than a lot of people are thinking. I think, there's a lot there's there's a lot of people sold on Southern. There's a lot of people sold on Grambling getting better, but they got Aaron Allen coming back at quarterback to compete with uh the kid from Missouri as well. They got Jarvion Howard coming back. A majority of their offensive line is returning. They returned Terrence Ellis, Malachi Bailey, a lot of that front seven outside of Claude, but I think he can be replaced. They got to replace Karen, uh was it Kinsler at safety, but a lot of those other guys in the secondary are coming back. They got more continuity than people are giving them credit for. And I really do think Howard could be the X factor. If he can have, he can replicate the season he had at running back and they can just have a little bit of stability at quarterback and not have the special teams issues. I don't see why they can't win the West. It my my pick, they would be right now my pick to win the West. And I know People are saying I'm sleeping on Southern, possibly PB, PV, Texas Southern, but I need to see what Texas Southern did on the defensive side of the football. I did get sent some film. Um, shout out. I'm blanking on their, his name right now, but he sent me some film on some defensive pickups. I like what I see, but I just want to see the whole unit play together. So I, I would give all corn the edge over Texas Southern defensively, which is why I would put them over them. Southern, I'm still not sold that they have a quarterback right now. And until they have a quarterback and until I see some interior guys replace, if I'm not mistaken, Dumas is out. And also, um, oh, is, is it Preston? Or who who's the other defensive tackle that's headed out for Southern? Someone tell me in the chat. There's, a, there's another defensive tackle I believe is grad, or Peterson. I think Peterson has graduated too. For them, so I need to see what they do on the interior of the defensive line. And if I'm not mistaken, their D line coach also left um, Clark this off season as well. And then PV, great pickup with Caleb Johnson. I think they're going to be great at running the football. They return most of their offensive line, but they did lose some key pieces on the defensive side of the football that I want to see if they can replace. I think PV is a close second, but right now I believe Encore and as it is as we're sitting on January 24th which you could take for what you will, just a way, 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 way too early projection in terms of what I'm thinking about the SWAC uh, West race. But I think National Signing Day is going to be big for my opinion. But I'm going to be honest, with this, with my projections going into next season, the second transfer portal window I think is going to be one of the most crucial periods of analyzing where teams are because – Teams activities in that second portal after spring practice are going to tell me so much because if you are super, super active and there's a big turnover, it's safe to say you're not very confident with where your team is coming, coming out of spring practice. If you land a few people here or there just to fill some, some potential needs, I can, I can, I can assume that 
you're probably feeling okay about your team. So it's going to be interesting to see who panics and, and tries to have a massive overhaul going into summer after that first transfer portal window opens and who leaves. What happens if, you know, a bunch of players transfer out if they don't get named the starter? It's, it's going to be interesting to see. And so I, I will say that's my way too early thoughts on, on the West race. But, man, a lot can change because what happens if, you know, Aaron Allen or, or Tyler make a transfer out or Jarvion Howard transfers for some reason after spring or you never know so i will say that i think the next transfer portal window is going to be extremely telling about where a lot of these teams um these teams are going to be sitting going into next season uh the east recruiting i think jackson state and famu by far have the best east recruiting right now um alabama state's done a little bit bethune is listen we, we'll just we'll stay off bethune for the night we know they haven't done much valley's been up and down i saw they landed some kids out of the juco level and some and, and a few high schoolers if i'm not mistaken uh light on tweeted about it alabama a has been iffy they haven't been as active as they were last year they do have a lot of pieces coming back but i would like to see them be a bit more active on the recruiting show alabama state's been about average in recruiting, but I, I think Jackson State fam, you are setting the pace. Um, I think fam did enough. Um, I would like to see maybe another edge rusher in the transfer portal come, Dwayne. But overall, I think they did okay. You still got Gentle Hunt in the middle. I would just like to see potentially if if someone and it's not a, it's not a necessity because I think they have some good guys who can get to the quarterback. But if someone in that second transfer portal window enters the and there's the portal, and he's an experienced potential, you know, has that kind of, um, I'm blanking on the kid's name now, um, like Savion potential in terms of coming in, getting his feet under him, and then being a game changer late in the season, bring him in, take a chance on him, because I think that's what they were missing last year is the duality of pass rushers on both sides of the ball, um, or both sides on the line. Is, uh, on the line. So I just think if I'm fam, you another edge rusher would be really nice. You can never have too many edge rushers in today's age of college football. I know, what's your take on Eddie Jordan, Tennessee State lineup against North Dakota State? So that's in two years, uh, two years, Jarvis. So I would say, one, uh, if I'm – if I'm Tennessee State, the first question I have is, is Eddie George still there? Um, Because if he doesn't win, I don't think if he wins at a certain level this year, there's a potential he could not be there next year. But if, if he's still there, I want to see what the quarterback position is looking like. Is Draylon still there? Are they looking at the kid from Youngstown as the future? How do they replace Starling at the running back spot? And then also on top of that, they did land the kid from Valley, but – how are you replacing all the losses you had on the defensive line? They lost a lot on the defensive line, and that's a major question mark for me. Um, the one thing you have to have to beat North Dakota State is line of scrimmage play. And so I really want to see how beefed up Tennessee State looks on the line of scrimmages this year and how many of those players are coming back for this potential matchup in two years. And that's probably where I would stand right now, Jarvis. Like I probably could tell you more at the end of um, uh, at, at the end of this season. He was in the transfer portal last time I saw Nicholas. I'll have to look, but I, I think he was in the transfer portal. He might have declared for the draft if he didn't get a, the offer he wanted, but I, I pretty, I thought he was in the transfer portal. You see BJ Ballers, brother Kendall. I, man, Kendall had a hell of a year, Douglas. I think, I think Kendall's potential is through the roof. I mean, Kendall was like borderline all conference this year. So I think as long as he continues to develop, then he'll be just fine, man. I think, I think he's going, he's probably going to be one of the top corners in the probably the top corners in the SWAT coming into this season with all the departures. I think, I think Kendall has a chance due to his measurables too, to be just as good as his brother was, man. Uh, yeah, same thing for Mike Minterman. He's got to win. It's probably not great going into year one in the CAA. JSU's new QB coach going crazy in recruiting. We just offered Christian Martin, 2024 QB, 6'4", 210, and Trey Petty, number one QB in Mississippi in 2024. Uh, that would be huge additions. What is JSU's remaining needs, in your opinion? Um, uh, with Bro's departure, I still – 
I still would like to see Jackson State bring in another lineman or two. I, I just that's going to be a competition for a few spots on that offensive line. You want to make sure you just have the best. I'm not saying any of the guy the guys there can't do it. It's just you always want to make sure you have all your bases covered in terms of of offensive line. I do want to see potentially another middle linebacker. I think it, I'm not mistaken. Durante is coming back for Jackson State. I would say they need another guy because I I don't see. I'm trying. I'm thinking off the top of my head. I don't think there's another guy who's going to be able to step in and just replace Aubrey Miller right this second. I I, I just want to see them add a little bit more depth at the at the Mike spot because man, they are missing so much with Aubrey. Durante's a great uh, a great bridge guy, but who do you have moving forward at the future of that middle linebacker position? Uh, I would add a little bit of depth there, and they're loaded at safety, loaded at wide receiver. Other than that, I would say middle linebacker and offensive line would be my two biggest things. Maybe land another defensive tackle with a little bit of size, like one of those guys that, like like a Vince Wolfort type of player, where he's not going to rack up a lot of stats, where he's not going to be like a Warren Sapp, but just take up space and ease. Because when you have a guy like that in the interior of your defensive line, it makes things so much easier on your linebackers. And with having a new set of linebackers coming after Aubrey, having that guy in the middle that can just take up a whole bunch of space and make it easier for them to see things, keep offensive linemen off of them, that would be that would be huge for Jackson. So I would say those would be my like biggest needs right now for Jackson State. Yeah, BJ was all conference. He was all conference for me, but I think Kendall has that opportunity too, Douglas. How do you see the QB race for JSU? Um uh, mm, I would say due to experience, I would I would lean Brown right now, Miracle. Uh, I would lean Jason Brown. I think PJ Hatter could be a close a close second. I really, really like his game. Short's got short's got some opportunities, but I just think right now. I said this on the round table. I think Brown is a guy that he wasn't going to transfer anywhere and not start. He had one year of eligibility. He transferred out of VT because he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't going to see a lot of playing time. He didn't want to go anywhere where he wasn't comfortable or wasn't confident in his ability to take over the offense. I think Brown starting this year, he's a perfect bridge quarterback. And then they're going to develop Hatter and short and whoever's the better quarterback next season. TC is going to roll with them. And I already told you, if, if Jason Brown starts, I'll have no doubt that Jackson State can win the East next year. And we'll see, but I, I, I would be pretty confident with P.J. Hatter potentially as well. But I think Brown is the X factor this year for Jackson. I, I would be very, very surprised if Brown wasn't the quarterback taking the first snaps in Atlanta uh, for Jackson State against South Carolina State. Yeah, I think um, – is that – the is that the other offense? I think I talked about on last live stream. I think if I'm not mistaken, I think I talked about him at the end of last live stream. Um, but I'll pull up his film going into the next show and do like a full breakdown on him. Cause I think a few people have messaged me and asked about, about him. Uh, Musa offensive player, offensive player of the year in the swag. What does that do? Um, I think, It would be big. Listen, accolades do matter in some aspect, but I think it's more of, man, Musa has got to be, if Musa can be the quarterback to get FAMU over the hump, get him to the celebration bowl, win the swag, that all does more to, that all does more to his draft stock potentially than I think just winning the swag offensive player of the year. Um, He's he's just got to improve on like key things in his game because I think right now let's say Musa came out right now, I don't think anybody in the chat, I don't, I don't think anyone at FAMU would say that he deserves to get drafted. He's just got to work on key things in his game to prepare him for the next level, and I think doing that will in turn help him win offensive swipe player of the year. So I, I think it's all all one, but I I can't tell you. Like I'll have to do a film breakdown on all the quarterbacks of the swag, but I can't tell you one thing that he could do to improve his stock. He has the measurables, but I, I don't think just winning swag offensive player of the year um, improves his draft stock much at all. Um, 
Monty, I think they're going to be solid. I'm just worried about the loss of uh, Isaiah Hamilton. He was so he was so big last year, man. I, I don't think people realize how good Isaiah Hamilton was. Like he was he he shut down sides of the field. So it's just who's going to step up in his place. Is it going to be a by committee approach or are they going to have one guy who could shut down the side of the field like he could at times? So I, I'm worried about replacing him, but in all the other positions, I think they're going to be just fine. Can Maddox be a first team FCS All American? Potentially, it'll depend on what he does. I think he's probably a lock for first team all swag, but man, the, to to be a first team FCS All American, like there's only four spots and two of them go to safeties or two of them go to corners or whatever. Um, it, it's going to be tough, but it, it's definitely possible if he has the right season. Do you trust the corners for JSU as much as you did last year? Uh I want to see who the starters are first, Nicholas. Let me just see what the starters are, but I would lean no. I, I would say right now I don't trust them as much. Like I still think they'll be fine in the secondary, but man, like you're losing Nugget, you're losing Zay, you're losing Travis. Man, that's, that's three really tough people to replace, and I think they did a good job of bringing in people to replace them, but man, those are no – I mean, Nugget was – could shut down a field. Travis was Travis. And then on top of that, too, Zay was a very underrated corner. I wouldn't say I trust him as much right now, but I want to see what it looks like, what they look like in the spring and who emerges as the starters right now. So I have True Thompson and number 95 is back. Yeah, I'm not saying the cover was bare. I'm just saying um, more, more depth pieces at the defensive tackle spot is where I was m mainly going with that. Kendall is better than BJ. BJ has great technique, but Kendall is is good, but over six foot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. His measurables are out out the roof, man. Hobson is not at JSU. He's in the portal. Jay Davis will take that spot. It's Brown's job to lose the ball. Bones out his hand. Much different. I'm I'm man. Brown. I really do think Brown can be. Brown could be the guy. I, I've if Brown has swag offensive player of the year potential, he really does. I, I'm. I'm really high on him. Hatter is not at JSU yet, so uh, so we'll see Jason Brown and Phillips short for the spring game. In that case, ooh, mm. we'll see. We'll see. All right, so six four, Cam six eight, Allen six six. Is TC Taylor on the hot seat? No. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know if I'm missing something. I don't think you could put a first-year head coach on the hot seat. There's no way Jackson only gives them a year. Like, I mean, listen, Jackson could go 0-12 this year. There's no way T.C. Taylor's not the head coach in 2024. Alabama A&M, potentially, depending on – I mean, they would have to have a historically bad season, but I mean, I'm not ruling out the possibility. But I would say T.C. Taylor, definitely not. I would say Alabama a and is like lukewarm at most. Um, the boom, I haven't watched this film. Um, I'll, I'll watch the film after, after this live stream and, and bring it back to the, to the next show. Why would TC? Yeah. I, I don't know why TC would be on the hot seat right now. Xavier Spencer transfer from UTSA. I saw his film. I, I, I do, I do like him. I just want to see him produce like Isaiah did at that corner spot, but I do agree. He, he's a solid, solid transfer. Mm, Asias. I would say Asias makes the biggest impact, Kevin. Um, when I look at running back, it is as, as great as seven is, man, that's still Savion's place. Savion is going to be the workhorse. I think seven is going to be used more like a JD Martin type, you know, speed back in certain key formations or schemes, but it, it's it's Savion's job. And Asias is going to be a day one starter and probably a first team all swag selection, man. Guthrie is going to be an absolute monster. He is an absolute monster. And I don't I don't see how Guthrie isn't the guy for, for Jackson State in the secondary. So I, I don't I think he definitely makes a bigger impact next season at least. He'll be 24, 25 when the season starts. Yeah, he, he's definitely <laughs> he is uh he he's definitely older. Um no, I don't think so, Kevin. Uh the linebacker from LSU is more of an edge rusher. He's not a Mike linebacker. Um he I, he's going to play 
probably across from Niles Gaddy if I had to. He's more of a Doyle Gaddy type player, a James Houston type player than he is an Aubrey. He's not a Mike linebacker. He doesn't have that type. I, I don't think he has that type of build, that type of game. He's going to be on the edge. He's going to be an outside linebacker. He's going to be an edge rusher. That's where he's going to fit in the scheme. He's not going to play Mike. I'd be shocked if he played Mike, he, but we'll, we'll see. Jason Braun, a.k.a. the Cannon. <laughs> Which rebuild do you have most faith in? Valley, UAPB, or Bethune? UAPB right now. I, I really am high on Alonzo Hampton as the head coach, uh, Cam. I, I think he his recruiting ties throughout key states that UAPB has to, has to win. They have to win over these next few seasons. Now, I don't know what their record will be this year, but I think UAPB could – be in the top half of the West in a year or two uh, with Hampton. I, I really do think he's going to be one of those hires that's a bit quieter, and that's just going to work. And he's going to coach. He's he's going to coach that team up. He's going to recruit pretty well, and I think UAPB is going to be a sneaky team in the next year or two. Uh, Valley, it's just it's going to be it's so hard to win there, Cam. It, it really is, and I don't. I, I trust that. I, I trust that Wade can be a good coach, but it's just, man, how long is that rebuild going to take? And and what is success to Valley? Because they're in the tougher division and they just got, they get, they got the tougher road ahead compared to the other two teams. In my opinion, you have to find a role for seven, seven spin with the wide receivers. If he's going to play straight up wide receiver, then ugh, I still don't know. I, I still probably won't pick him over Asias. Even if he, even if he's with the wide receivers, I would probably still pick a size. But that's going to be interesting to see how they use him. I don't, th- I don't think Irv's there for the spring. See, I might be wrong, but c- correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I'm pretty sure Irv is coming after spring practice, right? I think Aaron said, or, "Yeah, or, I'm pretty sure Irv is coming later." But I'm, I might be wrong on that. Um, who's the better fit, Cookman, uh, for Cookman, Denson, or Woody? I would say Woody. Um, Woody, just because one, he is extremely tied to the state of Florida. And also, you know, Denson is going to be a tough sell just because of that 0 11 record BCU. Um, it's going to be such a tough sell. Let me take this call. Then I'll get to these last few comments and in the show, I'll make sure everything's set up after this power outage. Eight, five, six, six, you're live. What's going on, Blue? This is Jay Love. How you doing, man? What's good, man? Oh, much. Uh, I just want to call in. I got one statement and one question for you. Uh, but first, I want to say what's up to all the CI Love Nation out there. Uh, but I want to say this. I think I think PJ Hatter coming in as a freshman is probably Brown's greatest threat to lose that position. I think outside of that, he pretty much got it locked up. Uh, from what I've been hearing in practice, he's been doing pretty good. He's looking pretty good. But I think skill-wise, I think Hatter's probably the probably the most talented quarterback out of all of them. What you think about that? I think Hatter has the most potential. I'm with you on that. The one bad thing in a QB battle, though, is the fact that he's not going to be on campus for spring. From what I was told, yeah, I don't I th- think. What, what did you hear about that? What do you have bad grades or something? I just don't think he graduated till the end of the spring, and you can't be on campus till oh. you graduate. I don't think he was a mid year grad, so yeah. Just I, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, he doesn't graduate till May, which probably puts him getting at JSU mid May, late May, potentially even June, depending on when their graduation is. That's the only setback, especially when when I when I look at a QB battle, who has the most experience because they probably are going to learn the playbook the fastest and have the most, I would say, leniency from the coaching staff. And so for Jason Brown to step in there, almost 24 years old, he's been in all-conference selection in the FCS, he's played in the SEC, he's played in the ACC, that's not a guy you want to give a head start in a QB battle if you're a freshman coming in. So that's the only reason that I just can't see Hatter winning the job this year. I think they're going to redshirt him, and then next year he'll probably be the starting quarterback in 2024 for Jackson State. Gotcha. That, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. All right, my second question. Where, if Valley has 
another losing, like ridiculously losing season. Like, what, what did they do? Two? What, what were they? Two and two and nine, two and two and ten last year. What, what were their record? Who who is that? Valley. I think they were two and nine, if I'm not mistaken. Two, yeah, because yeah. they beat PV and A and M. They beat exactly. They beat PV and A and M. Right. So after this year, they go in. Let's say they have another one two win season. Where do they go from there? Like, do they st- do they stay in the swag? Do they consider going down to D two? What do you think? For what I was told, Valley is never going to consider going D two unless they're forced down. And due to the history they have in the conference, I don't see the SWAC forcing them down. What's going to – their place, let's just say if nothing ever turns around, is they're just the Vandy football of the conference. Every conference has that school that doesn't win, that isn't really competitive. I don't know – Does maybe because I'm a football guy. I don't really watch a lot of other sports at the collegiate level. Does Valley win in any other sports? I don't know. No. Nope. Because no, they don't. Because if because if they're like the Vandy, they could be really competitive in another sport and be just fine. But you know, we're really hyper focused on football, especially on this channel. They're just not gonna ever win the SWAC right now. And you never know. Listen, college football, it the ebbs and flows of college football are so unpredictable that hey, maybe in ten years they could shock everyone and be really damn good, just like they were in the Jerry Rice days. But I don't think the swag ever forces them down just because they were, they're such a staple historically in the conference. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for taking my call blue. I really appreciate it. Hey, appreciate you, man. Yeah. So someone in the chat said they haven't won a game in basketball this year either. That's tough. Yeah, that's brutal. I'm not going to lie. That's, Oh, uh, let me see. I'm going to try to answer these last few questions, man, and get out of here. Okay, so Hatter said on the 1400 so that he comes in May. Yeah, in, in that case, then, um, you know, let's see. Connie, the top Juco center that committed JSU last year, is in Jackson now. I think we'll get him this time. Okay, I'll, I'll go watch his film after the show and kind of give you all my take. I, I must have missed that. Man, with the transfer portal and all the high school commitments, man, it is brutal to try to be like a national – offer national coverage of anything because man it is like every day there's commitments left and right uh the most explosive player in the swag is nico duffy but at the slot position and pump or kick returner not at running back the mad hatters the future is hard for freshmen to play in the swag we all know that oh let's see are you going? Yes, I, I will be at the HBCU Legacy Bowl. I'm so excited, man. I got to cover it all last last year. I was down there the whole week, had interviews with Willie Simmons, a bunch of the players, and I'm looking forward to, you know, I mean, listen, y'all saw the camera coverage. It looked a lot different than my coverage last uh, from, you know, previously. We're going to have some great pictures. We're going to have some great videos, highlights, man. It's going to be in 4K this year, not on my little GoPro, and, and we're going to get some really dope interviews, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm, I've emailed some people um, in terms of getting a little bit more access with in terms of the coaching interviews and things like that. Um, so I'm really, really hoping to step up the coverage of the Legacy Bowl and the Senior Bowl this year moving forward on the channel. Every go be DC of Valley take his resources and recruits. <laughs> Did UAB? Um, I don't. I uh, I haven't looked at UAB recruiting. I'm be completely honest with you. Um, do you know? Do you think uh, Coach Simmons wins the swag? He'll get a. There's a chance. I, that's one thing. You know, I know he's been linked to a lot of jobs, and I'm I'm really really surprised Willie Simmons hasn't got ha, hasn't you know got a. A huge G5 offer. If he wins the swag and keeps winning, like wins the Celebration Bowl, Nigel, I wouldn't be surprised. But listen, I I would love to see Willie Simmons stay at FAMU, build, keep building what he's building. But at the same time, man, it would be great to see him get that opportunity. And if he left, I don't know how people would feel. I would love for for FAM to go get KJ Black as the head coach. That would just be my opinion, just off the top of my head. You know, listen, this is just all speculation. I would love to see it, but. Uh, we'll see what happens with Willie Simmons, but as as long as he wants to stay in the swag, man, that's that's good for the conference because he's a hell of a coach. Other than the running back position, did JSU improve? I think the, I think they they're just fine in wide receiver, uh, Kevin. And uh, at the end of the day, we'll see what the off the off. It's so hard to judge offensive line until the season, so we'll see 
if JSU improved on the offensive line as well. But I think there's a there's a argument that they improved at edge this offseason too. So we'll see. So the new transfer rule. So um, quickly, I'll make this the last question. So there's not really a new transfer rule yet. I mean, they're talking about making the second transfer not be free, but that really hasn't been passed yet or installed. But the transfer portal windows, I think there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, a lot of people are saying that you that you can't transfer after the portal window closes. So what what the NCAA did is to help coaches and players and everything kind of like consolidate the the insanity of the transfer portal and help with roster management is that they put it like I think it's a 30 or 45 day if you put a if if you say a 30 45 day window in the fall after the season you can enter the transfer portal then it closes as we go into spring go into national signing day to help coaches focus more on high school recruiting you you if you're in the portal before the portal window closes you can still commit you can still commit anywhere as long as you're in the portal that's a big misconception as people are like oh this player can't announce his commitment he's stuck in the transfer portal he can still commit any day the only thing is is new players cannot enter the portal after the portal window closes and then it reopens after spring practice for like 15 or 30 days and you can enter the transfer portal again then it will close throughout summer and the season and anyone still left in the portal can commit um whenever um i don't know what you're talking about daryl you can comment and let me know but um I, I don't know exactly what he's talking about so but yeah that's the new transfer portal rule people got so confused i saw so many people wondering why there were certain players still in the portal and and there's a lot of people who right before the portal closed Dwayne, they entered the portal knowing that they were probably going to come back, but they just wanted to see what was out there for them. And they didn't want to be stuck at a school for spring that they potentially didn't, you know, fit in or, or want to be at. So they just kind of entered just in case to give themselves options. And then they potentially could come back to their school if, if there's not any options available. So it, it helps roster management to a point and helps coaches manage high school and JUCO recruiting on top of the insanity of the transfer portal. And then the new rule is going to make it where everybody gets a one-time free transfer. But then if you want to transfer a second, third, or fourth time, you have to have some sort of, you have to apply for some sort of waiver. Like you had to have some sort of hardship, some sort of, external factor that is making you transfer for the most part um and so that that would that that's what the potential new transfer rule that the NCAA is looking at enforcing would be is that everyone gets that one-time free transfer but after that you have to have a coaching change you have to have um some sort of you know major disagree like there has to be some sort of region injury family emergency something like that has to uh ha has to cause your transfer and that that's what that other rule would be so i like that they're putting some sort of guardrails on the transfer portal because i feel like there's a it's so it's so sad to see and i know everyone in the chat in here is mostly fcs fans um Sam Herter pulled a statistic for last season. A bunch of a bunch of players from the FCS transferred up to FBS. Like 50 something percent of them, 60 something percent were all conference players. Only like 21% made like a legit impact at their next school. And like even less than that, that they were starters or all conference. And I mean, it just kept going down and down. It's just like how many guys were all conference, all the American players? and had a chance to really make their name and and create an opportunity for themselves, transfer up, a coach lies about an opportunity, and they don't make it because they got bad information. It just it is sickening to see, and there are great there, – there, there's really great stories of it. Um, there's really great stories of it working. Listen, Jared Verse from UAlbany to Florida State is probably going to be a top-10 pick next year. And there's there's other great stories, but man, there's a lot of people who get lost in the fray because 
I've talked to P5 coaches. I've talked to people who work in the recruiting space at on three, two, four, seven. There's a lot of coaches who a lot of prospects trying to move up from D2, FCS, group of five, just to have the depth. Because look at it from their perspective. If they can keep the guys that they already wanted to start and their backup goes from an unproven freshman to a three-year starter at Western Carolina who was potentially an all-conference player, and that's your depth piece, how much better do you feel as a coach in case your starting guy goes down? So they have ever that like at the end of the day, it's just it's sad that some of the advice and tampering that players are going through. And and I, I can't I can feel for the players because it's got to be hard to to know who to trust and who to get proper advice from. And I'm really, really hoping that um, players start listening to the right sources and getting good information, man, because you can one bad decision can mess up your whole career if you transfer to the wrong spot a coach lies to you a coach doesn't use you in the scheme like you thought you were going to be used and man things could just get really really iffy for their uh career but man listen i appreciate it man almost two hours on the stream hit the like button subscribe we're only a handful of subs away from six thousand. i really 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 do appreciate you guys some things to look forward to on the channel listen there's no off season here on the blue bloods we have um i had an interview with a four-time state champion of North Alabama commit on the website today, the blue blood CFB.com. You can go check it out from Thompson high school linebacker headed to North Alabama. Talked about his commitment there. And um, let's see, let's see. And there are some reports that have him going where blue says is going to go. Oh, I don't know what, um, but also got an interview coming up with Lindsay Scott on the channel as well. And then, um, Got some other head coaches in the works. Listen, um, I wanted to do a thing where I highlighted all the first-year head coaches, but let's just be honest. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to get T.C. Taylor. I'm just going to keep it honest with you guys. I've tr- I've reached out. I'm going to shoot my shot and see. Um, but I should have the coach for North Alabama coming on. I will have the South Dakota State new head coach coming on, the new offensive coordinator at South Dakota State as well. The DB coach at Texas Southern will be coming on later this week as well. And on top of that, I got a lot of other first-year head coaches from VMI um, and some other places lined up, UAPB lined up for the show. So, man, listen, lots of exclusive interviews, exclusive access that you guys can find right here on the Blue Blood. So, Go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. If you want to become a member, me and Coach Fred broke down all the Celebration Bowl film for members only due to some copyright, man. So go ahead and join the membership. A lot of exclusive content coming throughout the offseason. I'm going to make sure if you pay whatever, I think it's like $2.99 to support the show, you guys are going to get more content than anybody else who runs these memberships. Me and Coach breaking down the FCS National Championship tomorrow night. That should be out later this week. So make sure... make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, but guys up until next time, the blue bloods are out. (laughs) 